Welcome back to the AI Academy. My name is Jared Lettery, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Marco Semesigur, who, who is the director of the EV Laboratory in Valencia, Spain. He's well known to all of us and has extensive experience in embryo selection and has been deeply involved in AI and its implementation in the embryology labs literally since the start. Marcos, I look forward to your comments and thanks so much for contributing to our understanding, not only in this area, but all the other work you've done in embryology. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for being here in this uh, AI Academy. And uh, the first thing that I would like to do is to uh, introduce myself. I'm Dr. Marco Meseguer. I am embryologist and scientific supervisor in IVA Valencia. I'm actually, I was working in the lab and I'm just preparing this presentation for you in which I would like to share our experience trying to integrate artificial intelligence tools into the workflow in the embryology lab. This is uh, like a agenda of the topics that I will go through today. And uh, well, initially, let me talk a little bit about the introduce of the, introdu the introduction of new technologies in the lab. Um, we have quite a large experience here in Valencia introducing technologies in the lab in the last years. And a uh, few, few years ago, let me use the, the pointer. A few years ago, we, uh, a couple of years ago, we published a paper in which with a special group interest in ESRE, talking about recommendations of clinics before starting uh, Thailand's technology. But in any case, this is a recommendation that can fit for any technology that we can introduce into the lab. And there are things important, especially for example, the reasons to introduce any new technology, sorry. Um, also the, the interest in identify uh, which are the, the points that is, are gonna help us to uh, improve our outcome. Uh, evaluate all the technical skills needed and all the technical needs necessary. And of course, finally, and the most important, we need to educate the clinical staff. And maybe this is why we have this, this academy ongoing, trying to promote the concepts of artificial intelligence. So I'm pretty sure that during these uh, lectures, you're gonna have uh, many concepts about artificial intelligence, but I have bring some of them coming from embryology. Um, because when we work in the lab, this is a video done by Lorena Bori, one of our PhD students working on artificial intelligence. The first thing that we have to do is to have a, a good system for claiming the database. So we have to easy go to our data set and select the data that we want. For example, the embryos that implanted, the variables that we need to use and, and the embryos that we're going to analyze, for example, the transfer embryos and do the query to the database. Once we have the database, in any database of images of embryos, we have tons of images for every time frame. Uh, and any time that we do any kind of a study, we normally use 70% of our sample size to, to create the model. And then we validate and we test. The validation is necessary in order to generalize our work um, and also see if we can do any kind of improvement. And the testing is like a way to do an independent uh, measurement of the performance of any algorithm that has been developed after the previous training or the validation. So you know, you have seen that AI has two techniques, mostly described machine learning and deep learning. And if we focus this in the lab and in the embryo, if we use machine learning from images of the embryos, what we do is to get variables from images. For example, we get homogeneity, we get contrast, intensity, many things. Even we can do somehow um, segmentation of the image and focus and obtain these images only from the determinate parts of the embryos, the inner cell mass or the trophoctoid. If we do deep learning, that's a different story because then we give, we provide to the computer raw images and then the computer underline or selects which parts of the embryos are for that algorithm more relevant for any kind of prediction. The typical class activation mapping is observed in many studies about artificial intelligence in order to, again, underline the parts that are more relevant. So once we have this input data, these variables coming from deep learning or, or uh, machine learning, we have um, hidden layers and we have uh, visible layers. The, hi the hidden ones are those in which we do these calculations that may help us by combination to generate a prediction with a full connected system of ne neural networks or without that, but at the end, an artificial neural network system. And then again, the input in, 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 in embryology could be blastos images, could be morphokinetics, could be patient demographics. And then we can predict, for example, just the morphology of the blastosis as the embryologists do or predict implantation 
or maybe even predict live birth. So we have, um, I would like to share with you our experience using automatic platforms that came from AI, from machine learning to evaluate the embryo. The first one that we have been trying in Valencia for many years is the, is the Jerry. The Jerry has a software called Connect and Assess with two versions. The version 1.3 is totally manual and every step of embryo development is annotated by the embryologist manually. And then we have the Assess 2.0 in which the events of embryo development are annotated totally automatically by the system. So two approaches to end up with the um, annotations of the embryos, but with the capacity to, to do it fully automatic. So let's say that we save the time that we, uh, we use in all these annotations. And even the system is warning us when any annotation is out of the range that we consider um, abnormal. So we did some studies, and this is data that we published two or three years ago with Raquel Del Gallego, one of our PhD students, to, to compare the annotations done by the embryologist and, and this annotation system as S2.0. Uh, because of course, if the annotations look similar, the difference between them should be zero. And if there are a big difference between them, then we will have a problem because we don't know which is the best way to annotate the embryo. But we take a look to our data and uh, while taking a look to the early events, the uh, timings of annotations were looking very similar and the late events, we try to observe a uh, bigger difference. If you overlap, for example, the time of cleavage of six cells is quite similar between uh, the Jerry annotations and the embryologist in IVI in Valencia. Uh, at the end, the system is giving you full annotation or until blastocyst uh, hatching. And again, it's warning you when one annotation is done out of the range that the literature consider normal. And then it's like um, warning you in order to review this annotation and, and change manually and modify. Uh, a different step on this system of um, embryo evaluation is the EVA Extend. The EVA Extend, which was included in the Jerry, provides uh, automatic annotations of some of the events of embryo development plus a, a manual annotation of the number of cells and the maternal age is providing you an score from one to five. That is somehow a almost a totally automatic system for embryo evaluation and selection with a grading. So this system that is giving you again a score from one to five, uh, we have been working on them, uh, trying to uh, evaluate its performance here in Valencia. It was part of the PhD uh, work of one of our embryologists, Belen Aparicio. And uh, well, if you take a look to the data, the first thing that we realize is that the distribution of these five numbers is relatively similar globally. Um, initially, the system was using dark field, actually it's not using that, but it's taking these annotations to do this classification. From one to five, um, if we take a look to this score in day three, the higher the score, I mean, the higher the number, the, the number one is giving the higher blastulation rate, number five, uh, the lowest blastulation rate. So the highest score, the lowest uh, rate of blastulation, in this case, viable blastocyst. Uh, this is the global blastulation day five and day five and day six. And you see distribution more or less similar with more embryos in the best categories. And when we compare these numbers with the implantation potential of the blastocyst that we transfer, uh, well, you see a gradient of, of uh, uh, implantation from number one to number five, from 55% to 27.9. Well, even with the logistic regression, with the intention to compare the classical morphology with uh, EVA extent, and uh, we demonstrate with this uh, uh, logistic regression that both classifications are independent, that number one uh, 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 has an implantation rate 2.56 times more than number five, and the same for number two versus number five, which is somehow a, a magnitude similar to the difference between grade A and grade C of morphology of the blastocyst. We take a look to the performance of this system in towards the embryos that are in our PGTA program with biopsy. So if the embryo was classified as one of the three, more chance to be biopsied and it's five only 70%, from 74 to 717%. So big difference between them. But the embryologists normally have a lot of curiosity. And when we perform manual annotations, we explore the curiosity of the embryologist. And uh, manual annotations, it has been done always 
since we have time lapse in 2010. And uh, we have spent a lot of time just looking to new parameters that may provide some insights in the embryo development. For example, in this study performed also by Lorena Bori, she did some uh, annotations of the pronuclear stage, the uh, times in which the embryos are up, the events or the pronuclear appearing and disappearing, and, um, and also the time of the second polar body extrusion, et cetera. So in average, if you want to annotate all the events that you consider relevant for embryo evaluation, for example, in this case, all these, these important or not events, you can spend around three minutes per embryo. So it's, a, it's a quite a lot, a lot of time, even if you consider the, all the embryos from a patient. But on the other side, like embryologists, we're learning a lot of things about the behavior of the embryos. And even more, we can try to relate all these events a part of the uh, timings of cleavages of embryo development that may be related with, uh, with the outcome. In this study in particular, even we evaluate the uh, duration of the cell cycle of a trophoctodon cell are even the, the area of the inner cell mass and um, the uh, total uh, surface or the final diameter of a plastic. So if we put all this information together, we did the uh, um, we did the, uh, the attempt to do it in a publication that we did like uh, two years ago in fertility and sterility. We just take a look to these new events that I have described and we combine with the classical events like I, like, which are the timings of the events of embryo development. We combine all of them and we use artificial neural networks. In this case, this is a classical machine learning project in which we have the annotations done manually and we just combine these hundreds of annotations by each embryo to, to try to develop a model to predict uh, the outcome. In this study in particular, we play with different artificial neural networks. Some of them are using only morphokinetics, some of them are using only these uh, particular behaviors of the embryos that we believe are important coming from the curiosity of the embryologist. And we combine all of them. Well, in this neural network in which we combine all of them, we end up with, a, with an error in the cube around 77. 0.77 and a accuracy of 76%, which is pretty, pretty good accuracy only coming from manual annotations. Manual annotations can be performed also in the embryo evaluation after warming. This is a study that we publish in Fertility and Sterility, in which we evaluate the initial uh, area of the blastocyst and the initial signals of the sauna pellucida. We keep the embryos there for four hours, and then we evaluate again the aspect of the embryo four hours later and which is the final uh, diameter of the embryo and after four hours uh, prior to transfer and which is the zigness of the sauna pellucida. So we play with all this data and uh, we use for evaluation of the embryo quality after one. In this study in particular that we use these parameters, again, we use uh, artificial neural networks. In this case, it was a multi-layer perceptron artificial neural network and with three, with two Haydn lawyers and uh, with a prediction of the outcome. And we end up with one of these uh, artificial neural networks in the blind test in which the accuracy was around 26%. Finally, we have another system called uh, uh, KidScore. KidScore is another system that we have been using in our clinic in Valencia, which is based on how in artificial intelligence and machine learning because it's based in annotations. And in this video, we'll show you how it works because uh, you may see how um, the embryos are growing and uh, the annotations are performed semi-automatically by the system. We have like um, a suggestion of the event of embryo development that we, we just need to decide if we do or not. And then the system is doing the confirmation. We do the confirmation with embryologists. So it's, let's say, a semi-automatic process of evaluation of the embryos with a potential calculation of the outcome. We can play with the guided annotation software to be more or less strict in order to do annotations. And then maybe we need to uh, check not all the annotations, maybe some of them. But uh, even knowing that the configuration may reduce the time needed per embryo to do annotations, everything needs to be confirmed. And finally, once we have the annotations done and we check each one of the embryos, you see in gray the annotations that are uh, suggested, and we are going to 
to um, confirm all of them, we will have an score, an score that is moving from one to 9.9 .9, and it's going to help us to do a quick selection process because we don't need to recheck again each morphology or compare between you know, the values or even take a look again to the embers. We just follow the selection and we choose the one with the highest score against the one with the lowest score. Well, from this study, we have a publication just recently done in, fertile, in human reproduction, sorry. This study is the biggest one in which we have validated the KID score with close to 2,000 uh, embryos transferred from the single embryo transfer program. We compare between implanted and not implanted embryos and between uh, live birth positive and negative. And we compare the values of the KID score. Um, well, you see there the distribution of the averages is always the values of the KID score were higher in embryos that were um, uh, implanted or have a live birth compared to those that not. And if we take a look to the kids' score values in relationship with the outcome in four categories based on quartiles, the highest the score, for example, over 7.5, we have around 60% of live birth rate. Below 5.4, 32% of live birth rate. Even with detailed logistic regression analysis, so globally, kids' score is related with the outcome of live birth with an odds ratio of 1.2.1.23. I mean, one unit more of kids score 1.23 more chance to have a baby. This was observed in the outside donation program in standard cycles, but we did not observe those, that relation between kids score and the outcome in PGTA cycles. And the reason behind could be that in the PGTA cycles, we do assisted hatching on day three, and that may confuse the annotations after that event. But also we did the, the evaluation of the IDA score, like a fully automatic evaluation system for selection. The IDA score is a different concept and you will start to see more. You need only one minute per patient, it's true, because you don't need to do any kind of annotation. We just go directly to the IDA score and uh, you have your patient, you look for your patient in the database and then you have in one minute the ranking of the embryos and you can just order them from the highest to the lowest and select the one with the highest implantation potential. And that's all, and it works. And it's a good way to uh, evaluate the embryo. You can take a look of each one of the embryos if you want, but it's a very quick process for evaluation. So I did some calculations about the time needed for manual annotations and selection. Uh, like I have mentioned before, annotation of, of, of the events, the morphology, and then the selection, and more or less, my calculation is around you need 26 minutes per patient to evaluate the, all the core by time lapse. If you use a semi automatic system like the kids' core, that may, may reduce to 10 minutes per patient. But if you use a fully automatic system like the IDAS core, you just need one minute per patient. So the, the time safe is really outstanding. If you think, for example, in a clinic like ours, that we're going to have like six patients per day to evaluate embryo selection or transfer. You will need three hours in a classical and uh, one hour in a kid score and only six minutes per day using it as score. So they also the difference is, is, is really important in a, in, a, in a normal clinic that you are going to do transfer to six patients to the selection of six patients. With the IDA score, <coughs> sorry, IDA score, we have done some kind of evaluation since we're using in 19, uh, 2099, uh, 2019, sorry. So we observe a clear relationship between morphology and um, IDA score. The best morphology, all the categories are concentrated between 10 and 8. And then the worst category, you see more variety, but most of the embryos in the worst one. And you see there the averages of, of the IDA score related with morphology, very, very clearly associated. With the PGTA cycles, we, did, we get somehow more or less the same, less of eight in either score, more than 8.76, who you see the gradient in Euplody, the more, the higher the score, the more chances to be chromosomically normal. The average between Euplody and Euplody embryos in either score are so significantly different. And um, taking a look to the correlation between implantation and either score, in this case, you see, again, this data we presented in Ezra, the higher the score, the more chance to have a, an ongoing pregnancy. Uh, with five, three categories that I have done here. And the average of either score is higher in the embryos that implanted or not. Even with data logistic interrogation, we know that this is retrospective data. We have some heterogeneous population, but we quantify the relationship between either score and the outcome. And the odds ratio is quite high, it's quite high, it's 1.5. 
uh, is significant. It happens in standard cycles and in oxidation, non PGTA. But a clear relationship, one unit more of either score multiplied by 1.6, the chance to have a baby in our oxidation program, for example. Other systems that we have been trying, like the EMA, the EMA is a system that is connected to the Emberscope that we are testing as part of the PhD work of Lorena Bori too. So in this study, we check first how it was related with uh, morphology evaluation, in this case of the EMA. We compare the classification that we do here in IBI Valencia, like ACB with the accuracy done by the EMA score, and we observe an accuracy of 92% in the classification of the morphology following the criteria of this EMA score or our criteria. So it's, it was quite similar. And in this case was done, this classification was used, was done using convolutional neural networks and deep learning. Um, we check also the accuracy of the uh, this score for prediction of blastulation that was uh, 0 0.85 or 85 percent and the accuracy for uh, prediction of uh, implantation was 72 percent or 0 0.72 and for doing this uh, um, training of the model and validation or test in this case we use 4,000 samples or 4,000 embryos for each one of the predictions. This is the model that we have been testing again, not for we have not using in clinical use only for uh, research at this point, but it's giving you a nice overview of your patient in the day and of course also a nice overview of the KPIs of the lab. What else? I'm just finishing. What else we can do to use AI for ember selection? Well, uh, we did a study in which we combined ember secretome and image analysis. This study was done with images of blastocysts coming from time labs in which we, we get some morphology variables by using machine learning. And we combine with protein levels in the culture media. And we use artificial neural network with one layer, hidden layer, and then two uh, uh, layers, one for input and one for prediction. The study was really relatively outstanding because the artificial neural network for morphology was trained in a database of 131 embryo transfer, and then the model that was combined with proteomic profile used 81 embryos um, that were from our PGTA program, single embryo transfer, helplit embryos. And we measure this uh, contents of the media with the uh, image analysis to do a prediction of the outcome. And we end up with a model that was using 20 variables of morphology plus two variables of contents of the embryo and the media, in this case, two proteins, and with a capacity of prediction of live birth amazing 100%. Of course, this was a very, very limited database, but the results were really outstanding. Well, some conclusions about the studies that we have done. Well, first of all, it's obvious that any kind of technology, we are going to base AI on time lapse. So even like we did in time lapse, any technology must be guided for, any, for clinical use. And there are many recommendations that may work for. In our experience using um, partially or fully automation of our selection and prediction, is going to have the same accuracy like the embryologists do. Well, we have been testing Jerry and looks at the annotation software is similar like we do like embryologists. Um, in related with the IDA score, it's true that is reducing dramatically the time spent from the selection. We have validated uh, kid score uh, internally and the gradient of kid score and it has been published in human reproduction. We are doing the same with IDA score and actually the values are slightly higher than the kid score, but it works really well. And um, the difference is that with the IDAS score, we are using a fully automatic system. And we have been testing also another system, which is the EMA, that at least is doing a, a substitution of the embryologist for do the classical morphology evaluation at this point. And that's our experience with this technology. Finally, let me introduce five of the senior embryologists that are helping me a lot with this project of AI. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. This is my link and also in Instagram. All the research that we do we are, are financed by European community and also the Spanish government. And this is a team of PhD students that are working with me in Valencia, um, together with some, there are many of them are embryologists, but also I have some bioinformatics and engineers. And that's all from my side. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, see you soon. That was excellent. Um, Marcos, thank you very much. I always learn something from the, the work that your team does. There's a couple of thoughts that come to mind as a clinician and a wannabe embryologist. 
um, I'll make a definitive statement. I think we should look beyond outcome improvements with artificial intelligence. If we look solely at that, I think we're selling the technology short. One of the take home messages for myself from this presentation is that there's an opportunity here to improve workflow. And I think that's the second big imp impact AI is going to have, not only in improving outcome, which will happen e even more definitively in the very near future, but there's an opportunity to improve workflow. I can tell you in our own practice here, the number of patients that are coming through the doors continues to increase. The indications for doing IVF, fertility preservation, uh, just is through the roof. And we're going to have to figure out better ways for throughput and the tools that were just described by Marcos fits that bill. Um, I'll pause and there may be some questions from the participants. There are 21 that are registered um, and look forward to some questions. Uh, uh, interesting, so there's a question here, I'll read this. Are you finding embryologists are open to the integration of these tools or is it hard to get buy-in? Um, as a clinician, and I think this extends to the embryology team, I can tell you this. From the time of a new product or device or diagnostic tool in clinical medicine to its description with convincing data, evidence-based data, comparative studies, from the time of introduction to the time of uptake is approximately seven years. And that's for the clinical side. And I would bet that the, there, there will be similar um, timelines, maybe a little bit shorter because embryologists are more technically oriented than providers. Uh, uptake, change in habits, at least what we've learned uh, from clinical medicine is extremely difficult. There's a recent article in the Harvard Business Review and the title of the article was something like, it's going to take more than dollars to convince providers to change their behavior. How it will shake out with the embryologists, uh, I'm not quite sure. The uptake for a lot of these tools in clinical medicine has been slow. Everybody knows how they wanna do things when you're wearing a white coat. Um, uh, the tendency is to think that you know best. And there's, there's a basis for that. But I think the uptake will be initially slow, uh, but I think we'll get to 30,000 feet pretty quickly. There's a quantitative question. How much time does it save exactly? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Marcos would have that info. Um, but the citations that he had during the lecture were pretty dramatic. Um, going from 26 minutes manual, 10 minutes for kid, one minute for the IDA. Uh, that's just remarkable. Um, anything that reduces time will also open up time to pay more attention to details and make fewer errors. Well, if there are no more question postings, um, appreciate everyone's time. This was a great lecture. We'll sign off and look forward to uh, connecting with our next lecture.